record on this computer. My name is Arlene. Hi, Hi Arlene. Arlene. Hi, how are you? <laughs> All right. Well, it is 12 o'clock. And uh, so I'll get us started with a moment of prayer. And, um, and then if anyone else joins, I'll, of course, let them in. All right, let's pray. Merciful God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together in prayer and in fellowship with one another. You are our rock, our foundation. You are our inspiration and you show us the way. And as we read you, the words that you command to us, help us to take your words into our hearts, our minds, and our souls and spirits, and be inspired by these lessons that we hear today. In your name we pray, amen. 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 All right, so as I was uh, saying to Diane, um, uh, uh, Harriet was actually able to read the various passages ahead of time, so even though she isn't able to join with us uh, uh, physically, um, uh, I actually have a couple of her, uh, her insights and words, um, uh, so I'll be able to, to share them uh, with us uh, throughout the time, and I see that Susan has her knitting, ah, and there is yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Ooh, what are you making, Susan? It's a baby blanket that is very late in being gifted. Aww. As in the baby's going to be four years old on St. Patty's Day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Hello, Denise. Hi, Denise. All right. Well, Denise, um, all that you've missed so far is the opening prayer to get us settled. So <laughs> if you want to, on your own, take a couple of breaths as, as we're settling in, um, uh, we can get started. Um, the passages today are uh, Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17, Psalm 19, verses 1 through 14, which is the entire thing, on um, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 18 to 25, uh, John chapter 2, uh, verses 13 to 22. Um, so I have then uh, the NRSV version, of course, in front of me. And since I am at home, the Bible that I am, uh, the physical Bible that I have in front of me is uh, a new one to me called the Inclusive Bible. Um, it's uh, it's brand new. It just came in the mail. I'm and uh, but it's the scholarship that went into it. Um, it's it uses inclusive language. So again, talking about you know the different versions that we all have, um, uh, and um, and and so I'm still you know reading through some of the information about this particular Bible to see you know what specific scholarship went into it. Yes, Susan. Tell me the name of it again, the version. It is the Inclusive Bible, the first egalitarian translation. So, okay, thank you. Yep. Um, so I don't know where it lands on the continuum of, of uh, NRSV to, to good news to, to anything mm -hmm. else. Um, I, I don't yet know uh, specifically the poetry and the Psalms, for example. I, um, I'm, I'm exploring it. Um, but yeah, as I said, I have both the NRSV on the computer in, for, uh, in front of me and also uh, this new one. Um, so let's get started with Exodus. As I said, Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Uh, would anyone like to take these words and read them? Ah, thank you, Denise. So I'm again on the app, which I'm loving more and more. <laughs> um, and I'm going to do the, the New Living Translation. All right. The, the Ten Commandments for the uh, Covenant Community. I will preface, though, the small print. I'm still working on that, the eyes and the small print. So if I stumble a little bit there, that's why. Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord, your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. 
you must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself any idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the sea or in, or I'm sorry, or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affections for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commandments. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the, Sab the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, thoughts? Well, I always look at the commandments and go, geez, isn't that just common sense? Mm. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't kill people. <laughs> right, right. Honor your parents. You know, isn't this just kind of, you know, like common sense? I do always find um, in the Old Testament, um, boy, a wrathful God. Mm. Oh, you know, and I don't understand. Um, well, in mine, it says, um, I'm a jealous God punishing children for the inequity of the parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me. Mm. That one always throws me. Yeah. It seems pretty cruel. <laughs> <laughs> You're pretty unforgiving. I mean, what if the right? next generation, you know, right, right. <laughs> comes around? Well, what if it does? What do you think might happen if the next generation comes around? It, it's a very good question. Um, you know, and, and, um, and I don't have an answer for that because the, um, it, it does, it does seem very, you know, well, th this is this is the punishment, and 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 it's very it, it seems very transactional in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. and um, and yet we we just came from reading a whole bunch of Old Testament texts that that were all very non transactional, very much you know this is the promise that I have made with you, you know that that God says you know that I will do all these things, and and all of the um, you know all of the grace is you know God is giving. Uh, you know, making these promises and, and not putting anything on the people to, to make that transactional, you know, relationship. God is just saying, this is, this is what I am doing for you. Um, so, um, so yeah, to, to hear some of that, you know, I'm going to punish you, you know, it, 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 it puts some of that transaction back into the relationship. So, um, so I always wonder whenever I'm reading uh, some of these texts, you know, how how much of what we are reading has is, is you know explanatory words that have creeped into the language, creeped into you know the, what was written down to to help people process and you know realize consequences or you know whatever, um, trying to trying to get the people on board. 
and we understand transaction and we don't really understand grace um, or that, that, that covenant that came to us from God where we don't do anything to earn it. We, we have a hard time with that. We're very comfortable with, you know, if you do this, then I do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? You know, we, we can earn it. Yes, Susan. Um, out of the New King James Version, Reformation Study Bible, there is a, a reference to the word jealous. Mm. And it says, when used of God, the word describes his passion for his holy name, a zeal that demands the exclusive devotion of his people. It is employed when that claim is threatened by other deities. So um, in this sense, I, I take the word jealous to mean, I'm, it, I still don't want you to worship anybody but me. It's, it's not in the same context as we think of jealous. Right. Although, yeah. So I have five different translations I've been reading out of. Uh-huh. I love it. <laughs> yeah, so well, it's jealous in the sense of of not, um, you know, jealousy versus envy. You yes. know, um, uh, and 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 jealousy in this instance is more of a guarding. You know, um, you know, not a. Um, you know, I want what you have, and I don't want mm -hmm. you to have it, but more of a, I'm guarding this. Right. So it's a, it concerns Israel and assumes the covenant relationship analogous to marriage and the Lord's exclusive claim to their love and allegiance. Mm. Jealousy is part of the vocabulary of love, which is how we take it. Uh, this comes out, this is also out of the NIV. So interesting very now yeah. arlene are you uh looking up things and well i no i'm what i'm trying to find i thought there was a new testament uh re sort of reference to this idea of visiting on the um later generations but mm -hmm. I, i'm not finding it there was a passage from the uh, book of john but it just says to obey and keep his commandments and now I'm looking for the first, for, this is, these are notes in the Bible I'm using, First uh, John 5, 3, which I almost found, so. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps I, I asked you a little bit too soon. <laughs> well, now you know what I'm rummaging around there. <laughs> yes, yes. Three. Okay, First John 5, 3 is just, this is love for God to obey his commands, but, and his commands are not burdensome. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know where I had this idea that there was some reference in the New Testament where Christ had taken away that um, Honest. visiting later generations. Yeah. I mean, in a way it's true because if you have a, say a troubled family or somebody with criminal behavior, that often has a multi-generational effect. Right. I mean, just on, a, on an earthly practical basis. Socioeconomic, uh, absolutely, yeah. we see it all the time. You know, you have mm -hmm. generational poverty, for example, and that's nothing to the, you know, that, that's, that's not related to anything um, in these 10 commandments. That's just, you know, you, you do often see, things like this passed on. And so then our role as, as faithful people would be to go in and say, how can we help these systems? Well, but you know, well, then you also have people who engage in immoral behavior or abuse. Yeah. And that, that tends to- Yep. One, one generation to the <laughs> Sorry, right. I don't think it's for me. But... <laughs> oh, we had two phones going off at the same time. So, mm -hmm. um, so another interesting thing about this particular passage um, that really jumped out to me was, was the whole idea of idols and, and how easy it is for us to make idols of various 
things. We, we make idols of time, of money. Uh, sometimes, you know, we make statues, for example. So um, anything about the idols? The, the, um, it, it's very much related to, you know, you, you shall have no other gods before me. And, you know, how do we, you know, what, what do we prioritize and, and how do we sometimes lose our way? Anyone want to comment? <laughs> yes, Susan? I just think that idols can be anything, mm -hmm. literally anything, physical, spiritual, mental, um, whatever we set our hearts and minds on before God would be an idol. Yeah. And sometimes that's hard to accept. Um, you say, oh, well, my family comes first. Well, is our family supposed to come first? And, and that's, that's a very hard one because, yeah. you know, we, if, if our family doesn't come first, then what does come first? Well, you know, does our yeah. family come first after God? And, and what would God have us do in the world where, but we're still, you know, our, our treasure is still with our family, for example. It, it is, it's, it's, it's an interesting, you know, how, how do we live with that tension? Mm. And of course we wouldn't have families were it not right. for God. So, right. you know, we, we are meant to be in companionship with one another. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's part of, of the, the story of, that, that's how I read the creation story is, you know, telling us that we are supposed to be in companionship with one another. Right. I'm, I'm thinking of a friend of ours who, um, who he actually, well, it's really his wife. Our friend was from Massachusetts. He went to uh, Uzbekistan as a missionary. Um, he met a woman there um, who was became a Christian because of Dave. Um, and she literally left her family behind because they were Muslim and they would have nothing to do with her. The interesting thing is that they, she, and they, uh, she has been working for years on translating the Bible into Uzbek. And she's been all over the world. And it's just, they they have a family in Massachusetts. Uh, they did live in Uzbekistan for a while, but anyway, her, family now has all converted to Christianity. Hmm. Wow. Interesting. Had she not left them behind, I mean, faith-wise, you know, had she not reprioritized, they would never have even heard about God or Jesus. Wow. I mean, they were Muslims, but um, yeah. Great story. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Feruza, that's her name. Uh -huh. Denise, I see you smiling there, and I can see the wheels turning in your head. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, idol, the, that yeah. word, I'm <laughs> so much, uh, so much in the, in the news these days, and um, it's, it, of course, it, it, it all comes back, I think, to these pictures I'm seeing, yeah. if anyone has been watching the news lately. <laughs> Yes. Golden idols. Of idols. Yes. That was, you know, the, the golden calf, I guess, is what uh -huh. I would uh, instantly what came to my mind as I've been watching the news this past weekend and covering certain current events. Um, I, I, I honestly, I don't even know what to say right. <laughs> about it. But when I hear, I, you know, just timely, I think this passage and what's been transpiring in the news lately, that's immediately what my brain has gone to so yeah. I don't yeah. Know. yeah Denise you're not you um <laughs> as one might imagine I have a lot of pastors on my Facebook feed and um and the first that I learned of of the um the, the statue in question was 
various pastors all talking about golden calves and the Ten Commandments and, and not a single picture um, <laughs> until that, that came later. Um, but it, it was, you know, it, it was very, it just got me thinking about, you know, how, how do we set our various priorities and why do we set them the way that we do? And, uh, and how easy is it to, to, to get off course when we feel frustrated or hurt or, or left behind or, um, and, and how easy is it for us to marginalize, you know, folks who, who might be, you know, lost and, and following, you know, the, the latest idol or trend or, and, and I was really, when, when, when I saw, finally saw, you know, the, the picture of, you know, that, that all my pastor friends were talking about and then others, cause um, it wasn't just pastors on my Facebook feed that started talking about it. Um, uh, uh, it. It just, it got me thinking about how, how easy it is for us to, to point the finger mm -hmm. at, at another group that might be using an idol, but where are our idols? Though, mm -hmm. so, so yes, it is very concerning, you know, what we see in the news, but it's also an opportunity for us to, to examine our own lives and say, you know, what, what do we hold up? What do we idolatrize? You know, maybe, maybe not by making a golden statue, um, but still we, we have our own idols that we hold sacred yeah. instead of God. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I was actually somewhat glad that uh, that it just so happened that the lectionary reading for this week was the Ten Commandments instead of the Golden Calf. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought, oh, that, that's very good timing of the lectionary, and and uh, you know, it's a good reminder for us, you know, to, to just say, let's go back to some basics, you know, um, over the the, the summer um, and. Uh, and through the election season and and everything, you know, one of the um, uh, you know, you you shall not bear false witness. That was another commandment that just kept coming to mind. And and you know, how how easily do we casually just say, well, you know, this this particular word of God isn't convenient, <laughs> or you know. Right. Um, it's so easy to, with, with so many of these, to, to just say, well, you know, there, there's something else that's more important right now. So, yeah. Yes, yeah, Susan. The, the thing that comes to me is, oh, that's not convenient right now. That's, that's the word that I think of when, when I'm reading um, what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. and doing saying ah yeah sorry don't have time for that right now not right. convenient <laughs> <sighs> so we we spent uh, uh more than i normally spend on a particular passage <laughs> we spent it on this but i thought it was important so um now now harriet uh, uh she had some very interesting words to say except it was about the Genesis 20, 1 through 17. <laughs> so, um, so I'll be uh, uh, hearing back from Harriet what she thinks about Exodus, um, probably uh, by tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> she had some very interesting things to say about Genesis, um, <laughs> but uh, that's just a matter of, you know, it's e so easy sometimes to flip to the wrong uh, spot in our Bibles, but um, when is reading the word of God ever wrong? Um, it's not, so... Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, at some point, sharing uh, Harriet's words about uh, uh, Genesis chapter 20, but not right now. <laughs> um, so shall we move on to the Psalm? It's Psalm 19, uh, this will be a nice little palate cleanser after some of our, our heavy words about, um, about the 10 words that we just read. So Psalm 19, verses 1 through 14. Um, does anyone with a poetic version want to read these? 1 through 14? Yep. Sure. sure. Thank you. 
The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of all of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Our pastor in California always began his servants, service, sermons excuse me, with the last words of that. May the words of my mouth. Yeah, I, I did that for a while and, um, and then it felt like I was just rotely saying it. Um, <laughs> and it's one of those passages that, that, you know, you, you want to be very intentional because you, you yeah, it, it's, it's beautiful. It's, and, and it so eloquently says, you know, um, you know, may the words of my mouth and in my version, it says, and the thoughts of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. And, and yeah, it's, it's something that, you know, that, that I should cross stitch at some point and, and hang on my wall um, to, to just always look at and be reminded of, you know, of, of intentionality of of speech and thought and how easy it is to sometimes be accidentally unintentional in what we say and do we we always said it said this during our sunday school uh worship time in in the when we used to be down at the old methodist church from, the, from our church and um i'm not sure many of the children including me really knew what it meant but we certainly had it imprinted on our minds, which, mm. which was not a bad thing either. So, Right. That is to say that verse 14? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love verse 12. But who can detect one, one's own failings? Forgive mm. the, mes the misdeeds I don't even know about. <laughs> I, I was thinking if I if I remember when I'm you know putting together the worship order for Sunday I should you know include that line um, uh, in it I, I've been using you know the uh, materials from a sanctified art but I can always add to them when I you know have intentionality of thought <laughs> yes Susan I love that this and several other of the um, songs of David are um, directly attributed or directly pointed to the director of music. <laughs> I love I love the phrase. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went and got my hymnal because there are three hymns in our hymnal that cover this psalm. Mm. Um, one of them we're familiar with, which is All Beautiful, The March of Days. Um, the other two, not so. God's law is perfect and gives life. And the heavens above declare God's praise. Hmm. So among all three of these, they cover the entire text of the of Psalm 19. Uh-huh. 
Well, so we'll there's another, there, <laughs> another possibility for Sunday. Right, we'll have to use at least one of them in, in the service. Yes. Hmm. Any other thoughts on this psalm? Or just a good palate cleanser between? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Palate cleanser texts are good. You know, there's so many of these that um, when I was in seminary, they were called texts of terror because, you know, for a variety of reasons, either, either the material that is in them is traumatic for various reasons, um, or a particular text has been, you know, so exegeted that, you know, what can you say that's new about it? And, um, and so, you know, it's nice to have things that are just like, you know, this is soothing. And this is, you know, a good reminder, mm -hmm. yes, but it's it's soothing. It's soothing, yes. Well, that brings us to our uh, next reading, which is First Corinthians uh, uh, chapter one, verses eighteen to twenty-five. Would anyone like to read it? I'll read it. Thank you, Susan. Sure. I just have to find it. Yes. <laughs> Chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Okay. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Nothing, the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> so... Um... Uh, Harriet uh, just says that uh, you know, God has the power to transform lives, and that is the message of the cross. Um, and you know, here's another reminder that you know that that the Jews and the Greeks were both coming at this from you know they, they coming at trying to understand Christ's message from two different logic systems, and right. um, you know. Um, you know the, the the Greeks they do have you know the the, the logic the 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 if when uh, or if then statements if then statement yeah. right and um and uh, and in in Jewish history there's a lot of you know looking for signs and um and actually the John's Gospel um, also gets into a little bit about you know what are the signs um and you know how often do we fall back on, you know, logic or, or transaction, mm -hmm. as we've mentioned, um, or we're looking for signs and we don't actually, you know, remember that, that we, we need to have all of that assurance already in our hearts. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we don't need signs. We don't need things that yeah. are pointing out what is going to be. We, we have everything that we need already in our hearts. We need to rely on on love, yes, mm -hmm. and um, and and through that love, we will find our way. Um, but when when we spend all of our time looking for signs, um, or you know, for uh, uh, or or trying to to follow logic, we do need to have facts. Yes, I'm not saying that that we don't need facts because we you know, that's, that's a different matter, <laughs> but, um, but it's the, the, you know, Christ's message, uh, what Paul is saying here is that, that it doesn't make sense. 
because um, you know Christ came and and instead of being that conquering hero to rescue the people, he died on a cross. It was a very shameful death. Christ taught you know the people how to live well with one another, how to lift each other up, um, you know, and and it's. It wasn't a message that was after power or glory, um, and but how often do we use those terms? You know, the, the the power of Christ, the glory of God. You know, we're when when really what we need to be focusing on is is how to help one another, um, and and it's that change of focus that that didn't make sense because. Because while on the one hand, yes, it, it does make sense because it's good to, to help each other out. There's, there isn't any, you know, advancement in it. There's, there's no, you know, ruling over another because you're lifting each other up. Um, so, so that's, those are some of my thoughts. But again, what are your thoughts? How do you hear this passage? Yes, Susan. Well, taking it in the context in which it was written, because he's writing in Ephesus um, to Corinth, because he thought that everything was all hunky-dory in Corinth. And then he started getting messages. And so this was a reminder to the Corinth, the people of Corinth, um, that there are things that they need to be aware of or wary of, I should say, because they, they were backsliding. Mm. And so I think it's still a very pertinent message for us in this day and age. How, how often do we backslide? Every day, every day. Mm -hmm. And that comes back to those 10 commandments. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, the the the, uh, the passages are all very tied together this week. Um, sometimes yes. they're not, and sometimes they are. And, and this is one of those. It, they're all really. There's a lot of threads of connection between each of them and between what's going on in our lives that we see all around us. I don't have any footnotes on the um, uh, on on the passages in front of me because of the translations and versions that I'm using. And if I had my Harper Collins with me, then I'm certain that there would be many more <laughs> footnotes on on all of this. Um, but what are some of you guys uh, and gals, or I should say, you're all gals? Um, <laughs> but what are what are you uh, seeing? in in this passage well to me the passage um talks about faith mm -hmm. and that it doesn't come through um wisdom um i think a lot of that speaks to that it doesn't come from this it doesn't come from that it, it's yeah faith you can't logic your way into faith right yeah and, and whenever i see the word wisdom in relation to uh, to Greek, in this particular uh, passage, um, I do read it personally as logic, you know, yeah. Socrates, yeah. The, that sort of stuff. Because we also, in our faith, we do have the wisdom tradition, um, you know, Proverbs, yes. uh, wisdom of Solomon, which is a different kind of wisdom, right. um, and. Uh, and that's not to say that there's anything wrong with, you know, philosophy, you know, that, that can, that, that can give insights into human nature as well. Um, but that's, that's a different form of wisdom than, than the wisdom that comes through, you know, the faithful wisdom traditions. Yes, Susan. I do have a footnote uh, in my Reformation study Bible that says, um, wisdom of words, the Corinthian church had an unhealthy regard for rhetorical display. I like that. Paul will focus attention on what true wisdom is. In this verse, he reminds the Corinthians 
that the power of his own preaching did not depend on such skills. So it wasn't Paul's preaching that um, was the turning point for them. Mm -hmm. I just I just like that the, the whole thing. had an unhealthy regard for a rhetorical display. <laughs> Hmm. Let, yeah, let me get up on the stage and I'll read. Right. <laughs> and I think there's also um, even kind of like in a simple, like I, I look at this a, a little bit even more basic and simpler in terms of perspective. Um, if we, if, if your perspective is coming from an attitude of Christ versus an attitude of the world, because, mm -hmm. you know, if from the world's point of view, right? You're foolish. Right? <laughs> You're foolish to believe all this. Like you really believe the virgin birth? <laughs> you really <laughs> believe, you know, all of this? And so from the worldview, from the people around us, which is, which is where, you know, it, it does get complicated, right? Because the messages from the outside perspective is, this makes no sense. Right. But the inside perspective, when you believe in Christ and you follow in Christ is, yes, this makes perfect sense. And this is how you, you live your life. Right. And this is, this is, this is your guiding, the guiding principles. This is, this is what guides you. So it, it, it's also, I feel like here, Paul saying, remember that like, and, and as you're listening to the outside messages, versus what what you had said earlier Andrea about how you know that it, it's coming from the inside mm -hmm. that that faith like which voice is louder which which perspective are you choosing so that's that's what I get from that <laughs> yeah when when I was in uh in undergrad um I uh participated in a class called what was it uh, religion and society and um the the professor he he had you know many many disciples actually who would follow him around from class to class uh this particular professor um he he was very proudly an atheist but the lowercase a because he mm -hmm. wanted to emphasize that he did not believe in anything mm -hmm. um and uh and and he he definitely he would open up his his classes by saying my goal here is to prove to any Christians that are foolish enough to take this class that their faith is ridiculous and should not and, and that they should not have it hmm. and um you know to, to start out a class like that uh you know it, it definitely it can put up a barrier and and there were a couple of 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 you know, people who took the class who, who they got up and walked out and I didn't because I figured, you know, he's, he's going to look at religion and society from a, you know, how, how, how has religion and society, how, how have they grown, you know, together throughout the ages and what he says about faith, that doesn't need to affect my own personal faith. You know, I, I don't need to let, you know, what he you know, what his faith is, or lack thereof, affect my faith. But I can still learn, you know, the history. Um, and and we, we, we got into some interesting conversations. Um, and, and, and it was, it was a very interesting learning experience. So, um, but yeah, yeah, to, to but you, you can't, um, you can't prove Right. There's no way to prove. Right. So, and that's kind of like when it, when um, in that Corinthians it says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Yeah. You know, cause you can't prove it. I mean, that's not where, right. where faith comes from. Right. It, interestingly, our, our final project, it was a group project and, um, and I was actually in a group with, um, with four of this professor's disciples. And our group project was, we, we decided that we were going to uh, take the various God proofs that, you know, exist logically and, um, 
and and they wanted to to prove that that all of the god proofs led to saying that god did not exist and, and i said no 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 you've got all these proofs over here that also say that god does exist so you know what is the starting premise and so eventually we got to the point of saying well if you start from the starting premise of god exists then at the end of your proof god exists and if you start from the premise of god does not exist then at the end of it god does not exist and uh, um and and they you know the these other disciples they're like you know we we've never spoken with a christian who can run circles in logic around us and i was like i wasn't trying to run circles around you <laughs> i was trying to show you that 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 um that that there's more than one proof or lack thereof and and what you say might be foolish to someone else and what I say might be foolish to you and that's no reason why we can't you know talk with each other and not necessarily try to convert each other just you know we're going to say foolish things to one another and that's just how it is <laughs> so yeah it, it was a very interesting experience so uh, anything else or shall we move on to the gospel all right and uh i figure we have um you know about uh probably reasonably about 10 minutes left because i imagine that denise you have to get going and i've got another bible study so uh would okay. anyone like to read uh john chapter 2 verses 13 to 22 or i will i guess i'll take this one all right, and so I am going to read from, uh, from the Inclusive Bible. Let's see, uh, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. Okay, there it is. Since it was almost the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and pigeons, while money changers sat at their counters. Making a whip out of cords, Jesus drove them all out of the temple, even the cattle and the sheep, and overturned the tables of the money changers, scattering their coins. Then he faced the pigeon sellers. Take all this out of here. Stop turning God's house into a market. The disciples remembered the words of scripture, zeal for your house consumes me. The temple authorities intervened and said, what sign can you show us to justify what you've done? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. They retorted, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it up in three days but the temple he was speaking of was his body. It was only after Jesus had been raised from the dead that the disciples remembered the statement and believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. Anyone want to make some opening statements? I will. Yes. Um, some, some of the explanations in my study Bibles um, talk about the actual space where Jesus overturned the tables and, and got rid of the, the people who were selling the animals, that the temple itself was for the Jews to worship, and the Jews had to make sacrifices of specific animals. So it became very convenient. There's that word again for people to sell those items in the, the courtyard of the temple. Mm -hmm. However, the courtyard of the temple was also a place or was supposed to be a place for the Gentiles to worship. Mm -hmm. And so when all of this is going on, there's no place for Gentiles to worship because all of this other stuff was going on. So um, I just I just found it fascinating because I, I had not thought about that uh, in terms of um, why Jesus uh, destroyed all the things. He didn't destroy the temple. He just destroyed the, the money changers and, and all of that. And the term money changers itself was kind of re relevant to me. 
when we have to have money changed, usually it's because we're in a foreign country. And that's exactly why they had to have their money changed because certain mer merchants wouldn't accept the coinage of the realm or whatever else, um, whatever coins they were taking. I just, I just didn't think of money changers as actually being changed money. I thought of it as people taking money in. Mm -hmm. And that, that's all. Yeah, there was a temple tax and the temple tax uh, needed to be a coin without image or icon. And um, so, so that was the other thing is that, that people who came in with, um, uh, with Roman coins or, or, uh, or other coins of other realms, these coins all had a graven image on it. And so in order to, um, to actually give the temple tax, that was the other reason to have the money changers. Um, and, and then uh, the, the money changers um, uh, would take a, a cup for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, so there is, again, you have that transactional nature, um, right. you know, and, and, and instead of, of worship just being available, um, you know, you, you had barriers to worship. Right. We're, we're rather familiar with barriers to worship these days. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the cost that it is to, to, to make worship available, um, but, uh, but yeah, I've, I've always loved these stories of, of Jesus's temper tantrum. Um, <laughs> you know, it was also a very political statement that, yes. uh, that he made by, by overturning, you know, what was the accepted practice. You know, he, he really you know, put himself out there as, you know, someone who was going to go up against things that he didn't see were right. Um, I, I've actually, you know, had um, had conversations with people who uh, who don't like to to see, you know, uh, pastors out at, um, at various protests because mm -hmm. because you know Jesus wasn't political, therefore pastors should yeah. be involved in a protest. <laughs> oh, yeah. At which point I say, okay, <laughs> Jesus wasn't political. Let's, let's explore really? <laughs> why we think that because Jesus, that could be a whole bible study we could yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> jesus just his very person right from before birth yeah he was political yeah i guess it depends upon your definition of political yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> i think you're right <laughs> i think yeah I, I don't think you could ever find a more political uh, position than Jesus took right then and there. Right. Right. Or extreme. It was very extreme what he did. Very extreme. Yeah. Uh, let's see what other commentaries I might have about this particular passage. Um, let's see here. Nope, nope, that's, that's the wrong commentary. Uh, so, um, so a guiding question that I have in my study guide um, says in John uh, chapter two, what exactly is Jesus revolting against? Is he protesting the fact that commerce is taking place within the temple, trying to keep that space sacred and pure? Is he protesting the context and manner in which the commerce is taking place during the Passover when fellow Jews should be preparing for the feast as a means to, uh, it says counterfeit the poor and the foreigner as a way to increase profits for the temple. I'm going to need to figure out if there's some missing words in that particular question. Mm -hmm. But it follows it up by saying, where do you see modern day examples of corrupt and abusive commerce? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Especially since during this last year. Right. When there have been so many fraudulent uh, practices, either online or in person, but mostly online. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Just so, you know, so many people trying to take advantage of an awful situation. Yep. Yep. Scammers. Um, yep. Yeah. Well, that's a whole, you know, macro level, micro level question. Right. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. 
that could be right a, a whole conversation a whole hour in and of itself right so how do billionaires profit on pandemics when um, mm -hmm. unemployment and people are losing their job and the food lines yes. are bigger and bigger and bigger but yet we're seeing you know increased profit margins like never seen before but that's the macro level i guess and then yeah yeah yeah, there's, there's a lot to unpack in, in all of these. So I, I encourage you to, since we have, you know, a minute left, not even, um, <laughs> reasonably speaking, um, I encourage you all to, to, you know, go back to these passages throughout this week, make notes, send me your notes, talk amongst each other, um, and, and include Harriet as well. Um, yeah, uh, she, um, uh, yeah, basically talking the same stuff that, that we all mentioned, but also, you know, that that reminder about um, destroying the temple and rebuilding it and how Jesus was talking about himself and his body. And so this is, you know, foreshadowing um, the crucifixion and uh, and Easter. And once again, you have the people around him not understanding what he is saying. So mm -hmm. so a lot of, of lack of understanding over Jesus and his motives. <sighs> well, we should have a quick prayer um and uh, and head out um even though the conversation is definitely not done <laughs> <laughs> but such is time all right would anyone else like to pray i'm always willing to all right i guess i will let us pray mm -hmm. almighty and merciful god we thank you for this time to be in fellowship and discernment with one another your words are inscribed on our hearts and we seek signs and we seek logic. Remind us once again to rely on your word because that is all that we need. And in relying on your word, inspire us to be your hands and feet in your kingdom. In your name we pray, amen. 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 All right, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Be well. Be well. <laughs>